In this lecture we're going to look at topic 1.3, chemical bonding and properties. So in this uh, topic we're going to look at the different way in which the atoms can form bonds and the resultant properties that result from that. And basically there's three ways in which atoms can form bonds. You can either use ionic bonding, covalent bonding or metallic bonding. In this section we'll concentrate mainly on ionic and covalent, although we'll briefly mention metallic, although that will be discussed in a lot more detail in Unit 3. So we'll start by looking at ionic bonding. So ionic bonding is normally used to join a metal to a non-metal. So sodium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, magnesium is a metal, oxygen is a non-metal. And if when anything forms a bond, it's trying to achieve a full outer shell of electrons. In ionic bonding, the atoms achieve a full outer shell of electrons by gaining and losing electrons. So let's look at sodium chloride, chemical formula of course, NaCl. So when the sodium atom and the chlorine atom decide to form a bond, what happens is the sodium atom loses one electron. So its electron arrangement changes from 281 to 2,8, full outer shell of electrons, so it's happy. But because it's lost an electron, it's no longer a sodium atom, it's a sodium ion with positive charge. Whereas the chlorine gains an electron, so its electron arrangement goes from 287 to 288, and it becomes a chloride negatively charged ion. And that pattern tends to be repeated throughout ionic bonding, that is, the metals lose electrons to form positive ions and the non-metals gain electrons to form negative ions. So what does a ionic compound look like? Well, this is a representation of this model which you've seen before in which the different coloured balls represent the positive ions and the negative ions. So if you take that red ball there and say it's a negative ion, it's surrounded by lots of positive ions and vice versa, because there's a strong attraction between a positive ion and a negative ion, like magnets, opposites attract. And so that electrostatic attraction holds loads of ions all tightly bonded to each other. So when we say the chemical formula for sodium chloride is NaCl, we're not saying it consists of one sodium ion and one chloride ion. We have, if we contrast that with water, for example, H2O, that literally is one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. Here, the chemical formula just tells you the ratio of positive to negative ions. So the chemical formula tells you the ratio of positive ion to negative ion in the lattice. For sodium chloride, it's one to one. So you may have a billion sodium ions and a billion chloride ions. Now, the electrostatic attraction between the positive and negative is really quite strong. So the ions are held together really strongly and are closely packed. This means that it's quite, you need to put in a lot of energy to break these ionic bonds. And that means that they're all, all ionic compounds are solid at room temperature. So ionic bonds are very strong and so all ionic compounds are solid at room temperature. I'm going to just stress that word all. Okay. So if you've got an unknown substance and it's a gas or a liquid at room temperature, it's not got ionic bonding. Okay, what other properties? Well the other main properties you should know about is the ability to conduct electricity. Now ionic compounds do not conduct electricity when solid, but they do if they're molten or in solution. And that's because when they're molten or in solution, the ions are free to move. So here's the ions when they're in a solid, in the lattice. They can shake around, okay? You know, when we say they can't move, we don't mean they're stock still, but they can't change position, okay? They can just sort of vibrate around. But you dissolve it in water or melt it, 
the irons are separated and they can just move around and the ability of charged particles in this case ions to move around means it can conduct electricity so a very distinctive feature of ionic compounds apart from being solid at room temperature they don't conduct electricity when solid but do when molten or in solution okay let's move on to covalent bonding and this is usually used to join together non-metals so if there's non-metal atoms, only non-metal atoms in your compound, it's likely to be covalent. And whereas ionic bonding involves the gaining and losing of electrons, covalent bond is formed when two atoms share a pair of electrons. So it's a slightly different way of achieving a full outer shell. So it's most easily shown by looking at hydrogen, the hydrogen molecule H2. So each hydrogen atom has just one electron. It will have a full outer shell of electrons if it had two. So what they decide to do is to share. So they share those two electrons. Uh, you might notice this in future diagrams like this and this one there's a line missing which you would need to include in the exam. So just showing that these two electrons are in this shared area between the two atoms. So each atom can now see two electrons. So they've got a full outer shell of electrons. And that shared pair of electrons is a covalent bond. And that's what this line here represents, that shared pair of electrons. You should have some idea how that actually holds the two atoms together. We know in the ionic bonding, it's uh, attraction of the positive ion to the negative ion that holds them all together. So what happens here is that we've got two positive nuclei, okay, normally they'd repel each other, but they're held together by the attraction to this shared pair of electrons. So you've got electrostatic attraction between the positive nucleus and the shared pair of electrons positive nucleus and the shared pair of electrons and that's what holds the molecule together. Okay let's look at a couple other examples. Uh, an exam you might be asked to draw a diagram showing all outer electrons to explain how a fluorine uh, molecule uh, shares their electrons. Now, the important point there was showing all outer electrons. Fluorine's got an electron arrangement of 2, 7. We're not interested in those inner electrons, so we're not going to show the 2. It's just the 7 outer electrons that we need to show in our diagrams. So there's fluorine, one fluorine atom with its 7 electrons, 7 outer electrons, and there's the other one. They both want to have 8 outer electrons, so if they share a pair of electrons, they both now see eight electrons. Okay. So remember when doing these diagrams, just show the outer electrons, but please do show all the outer electrons, not just the ones involved in the forming the covalent bond. Some molecules involve double or triple covalent bonds. And you get that if the atoms have a valency of greater than one. So for example, oxygen. Okay. It's like an arrangement is two, six. So forget about the two, just show the six outer electrons. It wants to have eight outer electrons, so it's gonna to have to make two covalent bonds. Every time it forms a covalent bond, it gains the share of an electron. So here's our two oxygen atoms and if they share two electrons each, okay, so there's two pairs of electrons in the shared area, so that's equivalent to two covalent bonds, which would be shown as two lines. Okay? And each oxygen has now got eight electrons. And it works the same for compounds, H2O. Right, each hydrogen's got one outer electron, the oxygen's got six outer electrons. So each hydrogen will form one covalent bond with the oxygen. 
Yeah. So each hydrogen now sees two electrons and the oxygen sees eight electrons. So each of these lines representing the covalent bond, the shared pair of electrons between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Right, quite often you get asked about the shapes of molecules. So the shape of the molecule just depends on the number of atoms in the molecule. If you've only got two atoms, like H2, then the shape is linear. If you've got three atoms, like water, you get this structure, this kind of V-shaped structure, which has got very many names in books. Uh, I prefer to hear as a planar structure or a flat structure. You might also see it referred to as an angular structure or a bent structure. If you've got four atoms, the shape is pyramidal. And NH3, as an example, forms a pyramidal molecule. And this diagram here has got this sort of dotted line and a bold line. You don't need to show it uh, in that format, but just make sure all the bonds are pointing down the way. And finally, if you've got five atoms, you get a tetrahedral structure. So CH4 is a classic tetrahedral molecule. So one bond going up, the other three bonds going down the way. I'm just going to show you a common question that's appeared in a lot of the exams so far. It says the shapes of some molecules are shown below. Phosphine is a compound of phosphorus and hydrogen. The shape of a molecule of phosphine is likely to be well, the way to tackle this question is you have to work out how many atoms are in a molecule of phosphine. So we need to work out the chemical formula. So phosphorus is in group 5, so it's got valency of 3. Hydrogen group 1, valency of 1. Swap them over. It's pH 3. Okay. So there's four atoms in a molecule of phosphine. So the only one up here which has got four atoms in it is this one, the pyramidal structure. So the answer would be B. Right. Most covalent substances, you know, exist as relatively small molecules with two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, molecules, atoms in the molecule. If you froze these, this, these molecules down to a very, very low temperature, they would all sort of group together because there's a very, very tiny attraction between the molecules. But it's a very weak attraction. And as you increase the temperature to anywhere near room temperature, what you tend to find is that uh, that weak intermolecular attraction between the molecules is broken and the molecules just whiz off. And this means most covalent uh, molecules are liquids or gases at room temperature. So the size of the intermolecular force does increase with the size of the molecule. So you have a very big molecule. It is just possible for it to be solid at room temperature. But most covalent molecules are liquids or gases at room temperature, but not all. Okay. So they're usually liquid or gases at room temperature, although some bigger molecules can be solid. Now, you also get some covalent um, substances which don't form covalent molecules, but form covalent networks involving billions of atoms. So this is a diagram to show loads and loads of atoms all joined together by covalent bonds. And you've probably seen this structure of a uh, diamond uh, in the class before. So, and this is just a small section of what a diamond would uh, look like. It has billions of carbon atoms all joined together with strong covalent bonds. Okay. Now, the ones that you should know about are carbon in the form of diamond or graphite 
or silicon dioxide. Okay, you should recognise them as being covalent networks. Covalent, the most uh, obvious property of the covalent networks is that the way they differ from covalent molecules is that these, in fact, have really high melting boiling points. Because in order to move the atoms further apart, you have to break really strong covalent bonds. So they tend to have very high melting boiling points. You're not having to break weak intermolecular forces, you have to break strong covalent bonds. Okay, so some uh, atoms join together by forming ionic bonds, some join together by forming covalent bonds. So, in general, if it's non metal to non metal, it will be covalent. And if it's metal to non-metal, it'll be ionic. However, big but, okay. Experimental procedures are required to confirm the type of bonding present in the substance. You will find some metal to non-metals that are covalent. Okay? And you would know this because they wouldn't have the properties of an ionic compound. For example, if you had something like titanium chloride and you saw it was a liquid at room temperature. Remember, all ionic compounds are solid at room temperature, so it's a liquid. You know it does not have ionic bonding, so it must be covalent. So let's just remind ourselves what the properties are of the different types of bonding. So, covalent substances never conduct electricity. Okay. One exception is that it's graphite, okay? But apart from graphite, covalent substances never conduct electricity as solid as liquid or gas. If it's a molecule, it tends to have a low melting boiling point, but the networks have very high melting boiling points. Ionic lattices, always a high melting point and boiling point. And then the giveaway is the uh, conductivity do not conduct when solid, but they do conduct when liquid or in solution because the ions are then free to move. And I will just briefly mention the last type of bonding which we'll discuss in more detail in Unit 3. That is the metallic bonding. And they tend to have, well metallic bonding is how we just join together the atoms in a metal. So a piece of sodium metal, the sodium atoms hold together uh, by metallic bonding. They tend to have high melting boiling points and their major distinctive feature is that they conduct electricity when solid and liquid but it's the only thing that's going to conduct electricity when solid. Finally you see this diagram sometimes to represent the four different types of bonding. Okay. A represents metallic bonding, positive metal ions in a sea of delocalized electrons, and it's the delocalized electrons which can move and make it conduct electricity when solid. B is just covalent molecules, C is a covalent network, and D, you've got positive ions and negative ions, this is ionic. So make sure you can recognize the type of bonding in each of these four pictures. Okay, finally, four things you should be able to do. You should be able to explain how ionic and covalent bonds are formed. Gaining, losing electrons, sharing electrons, in each case, in order to get a full outer shell of electrons. You should be able to recall and explain the properties of ionic and covalent substances. So, do they have a high or low melting boiling point? When do they conduct electricity? You should remember the shapes of the simple covalent molecules. So learn the shapes for the two, three, four, and five atoms in the molecule. And you should be able to recognize ionic, covalent, and metallic structures from simple diagrams. Okay, so that's a brief summary of everything you need to know in this quite, uh, quite difficult topic of chemical bonding and properties.